Merci Patricia pour l'invitation. C'est un grand honneur d'être ici à Marseille à présenter la question de l'économie de la cannabis médicale. Mais maintenant je switch en anglais parce que j'ai beaucoup de choses à dire et mon français ne me permet pas de parler beaucoup. So, we will talk today about uh, the regulation of uh, and the market of Colorado mainly because uh, that's the first market for legalized cannabis and then we will see what is the evidence from Colorado and how we can use this to help the integration of medical cannabis in the European health system. So think, thinking that French one day will maybe have medical cannabis available for his patients, maybe we can try to learn what's going on to the US to help uh, to integrate it here in uh, Europe. And if I have time, I will present the theoretical model for legalization that I have thought, but let's see. So medical cannabis is, ca is very common right now uh, in the developed world. So all the blue uh, spaces is where it is basically legal and available sort of. And we see all North America and South America and most of Europe is in this situation. France is uh, in red. So it's not really clear if it's legal or not. It doesn't seem like that. But the debate is growing very fast this year. So it seems there might be like some change coming soon. So that's what uh, my study tried to help. So how, how is the healthcare going to change uh, his approach to medical cannabis? So we start with the regulation in Colorado so that we can understand a bit what is the um, impact of legalization. So. In the US, most of uh, the states have allowed medical cannabis, so uh, the majority of them, but we have eight states that have allowed even the recreational cannabis, so not only for patients, but for everyone that is an adult. And what we will look right now is Colorado. Why is Colorado is very interesting? For two reasons. It's basically the first uh, country in the world or jurisdiction that have legalized recreational cannabis, but what is more interesting for us is that it is the first model of, commer of a commercial distribution of medical cannabis, which in economics means that the supply is able to satisfy the demand or kind of that. And that's the first case where that happened because the supply was really uh, strong. So this is uh, not to say that Colorado allow cannabis for everyone, for whatever condition, because as we see, only nine conditions allow uh, a patient to obtain a prescription from a doctor. So there are like a state like Illinois that allow it for 37. So Colorado is kind of uh, like and is not very uh, uh, liberal on that perspective. So the history in Colorado is this. We have that before uh, 2000, it was totally illegal. Then there was an eight year period where cannabis was sort of allowed, but there was not really shops where you could buy it. And then in 2010, the shops start opening. And that's when we start having data and we can like have an idea of what's going on in the medical market. Um, and then in 2012, in November, there was this referendum where cannabis was uh, legalized uh, also for recreational use. And that started in 2014. So we will see what happened to the medical market after also the recreational cannabis was allowed. And if that has changed some uh, characteristic of the market. And here we are in 2017 with 1.5 billion of uh, revenues, which in a country of like 5 million people, it's quite a substantial amount. So if you are in Colorado, how can you buy cannabis right now? You can uh, go to a recreational store if you are over 21, or you can get a prescription and you can get it to the medical center, but you need to have a prescription from a doctor and you need to be from Colorado. So tourists cannot access to medical centers. So what the cannabis markets in Colorado look like right now? So this is the growth we see, and we see that since we have both recreational and medical market, the recreational market has been growing much faster, while the medical is quite stable. Um, but the products that are sold in the market has changed over time. So if we look in the upper uh, part, we see that flowers, that's what you imagine as cannabis right now, as a medical use flowers, uh, the percentage has been lowering, so it's much less. And we see that the percentage of medical products that are uh, concentrates or extract has almost doubled. So it's almost 30% right now. What does that mean? Because doctors prefer to provide the, the therapy as an extract because it's standardized and is much easier the dosage. And also the patients, the older patients prefer to use this oil or this concentrated product than to use the flower because of the stigma that have uh, from uh, prohibition, perhaps. 
What we see also another thing of the, of the market is that the price has been dropping for a serving, except for the edibles, that is the food, the sort of cannabis food, that's kind of stable. But all the, all the other prices have been dropping in the market. And the potency is also kind of stable. So you could imagine these flowers becoming stronger and stronger in THC, but actually the THC is always kind of about 20%, uh, uh, lower than 20% on average. This is all uh, uh, state data from the Department of Revenue. So. So what's the impact of this full legalization to the medical market? So what happened when we legalized the old cannabis for everyone uh, to the old market? So what we see in terms of dispensary is that when the legalization happened, the number of uh, medical centers that provide, pharma, provide mm, medical cannabis to patients has become stable. So maybe if there was no legalization, the number of medical centers and pharmacy would have grown still. But uh, we, do, we, we see that uh, it's been stable about 500 dispensaries in the country that sell medical cannabis, while the recreational stores has been growing and is still growing. So my research question is this, basically, is are the patients using the, med the recreational market before the full legalization? Or in other terms, is non are non-medical users actually using the medical market be before? And, and so is the recreational market uh, expanding the cannabis sales or is it just eating the medical sales uh, of cannabis that were happening before um, so the idea is that this new recreational market that started in 2014 if it was cannibalizing the medical sale it would be basically those pr those like patients that before were buying in the medical market that now decide they didn't want to be a uh, registered in a, to be a patient you know in the health uh, department uh, and maybe they don't they are they have sophisticated taste so the medical center cannot satisfy all their taste but if, if, if instead there is a market expansion, the recreational market, it means that maybe this new legalization is getting new users or is getting users from the black market or is getting just tourists and uh, smugglers that cannot uh, get medical cannabis. So do, are these markets selling the same product? So I, I look also what is being sold in the different like medical center and recreational stores and it seems they're selling kind of the same problem product. So about 80% of the dispensary sells something that is supposed to help uh, to fight pain and we have a bit more medical center that sell high CBD with uh, high strain strain with high CBD but it's kind of a similar kind of product so the big difference between medical and recreational market is not about what is sold the big difference is in terms of price so we have that recreational uh, cannabis is much more tax we talk about at, at the end 20 30 percent more uh, at, the, at the end price in the shops so this is the main reason why actually um, Everyone would have an advantage to buy in the medical market, actually, because it's much cheaper than in the recreational one. But, uh, but so this is one of the things that is very important to understand, to see how the recreational market affects the medical market, because you are introducing a product that is more expensive, actually, than what is sold. So it would be a bit strange that patients would turn to that. So what, we, what is the data set? The data set started in 2012 for the medical market. And uh, we look at, count, at the county level. So we look at, uh, because every county have a different like uh, legislation. So every country can allow to open shops or can say we don't want recreational shop. So we see like in different counties how the opening of the shops has affected the quarterly sales. And we also look if the, f the fact that a county has voted very positively for the legalization in the referendum affects the consumption per capita. And also then we look at the data on patients uh, prescription. So it's important to know that the data that we look, so the data on the sales in the market is very like, representative of the actual consumption because of all the patients, 80% of patients declare that they only buy from shops. And we have only 15% of patients that grow the, the cannabis at home because it's allowed to have your own cannabis there. But at the end of the day, after four years of uh, uh, both uh, of legalization, we see that still the patients prefer to buy it at the shops and not growing. So that's important. So what we see uh, in terms of aggregate level of the old like, uh, state, that the medical sales have been growing up until 2014, 2015, and then now they're kind of slowed down. And the same we see for the number of patients. So the number of patients uh, reach like 120,000 almost, and then now since 2015 is going down. So there seems to be an effect of the recreational market on the medical market. And in, you know, on the other hand, the recreational market is really growing. Like linearly, you see the green line is growing. We, I think now it's slowing a bit down, but it seems important uh, market. So this is the econometric model. I don't think it's very interesting. I don't know, it's interesting for us. 
Ah, okay, perfect. <laughs> so I, I did like an, a number of specification, but I just present here two because of the time and maybe the most interesting. So the first is looking at the revenues, the medical uh, sales, uh, I mean, as dependent variable. And uh, as independent variable, we use the number of medical centers and recreational stores. This is the first. And then the second one, look at the medical sales per capita. So looking at the population. And here we include other, other independent variable, like the population, the time, uh, the ballot. So the percentage of people that vote in favor of the legalization in the county when it was uh, so to understand a bit sort of the sentiment toward for cannabis and also leisure if there is a leisure industry uh, in the county and uh, the, if he's at the border so this is the first one um, what we see basically is that we find the cannibalization here in the rms is like recreational stores so what we see is that every new recreational stores opening in a county decrease of $22,000, there's a decrease of $22,000 in the medical market. And that's per quarter. So when you look at the yearly effect, it would be a $90,000 less sale in the county if there is recreational stores that open there. Uh, so this is about a 5% reduction in terms of, uh, um, um, yeah, so in terms of uh, elasticity. So this is like a 5% reduction that we see uh, for this. Uh, when a, a recreational store is open. Uh, different, a different store, and here we look at different specification with random effect, fixed effect, and first difference. I mean, the first difference give a bit of a stronger uh, effect, but we think the random effect is more, uh, um, more, more, more precise. Uh, and then here we look at the result per capita, and in the result per capita is a little bit like, we see a 10, 15 uh, dollars reduction of consumption per capita in the medical market, every recreational stores that opens. Uh, we see that the sentiment towards cannabis is positively like correlate, like is significantly uh, significant with the consumption of medical cannabis per capita. So it means that in a county where everyone is kind of positive towards the use of cannabis, there is a higher chance that the consumption of medical cannabis is higher. So there is a sort of ideological also uh, component involved on the use of can medical cannabis. And uh, but yeah, so we and we see also here a, a reduction of the medical sales of about 10% uh, a bit more. Um, so w when we think about which are the drivers of this cannibalization of this reduction of the medical sales, we see two po potential possibility. We see the lower sales per patients so that every patient is buy a bit less because you buy a bit in the recreational market or there, there are just fewer patients. And I don't know what you guess it is of the two. We'll see. So. Average consumption per patient has been increasing. <laughs> so it definitely is not this. <laughs> actually, it's a bit stable, like the last uh, three, four years, but it's kind of increasing. So patients are actually using more cannabis per, 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 like per patient. There is greater consumption. This is a daily consumption, how much they spend. So the difference is in terms of patients. So there are less patients. And this is like a big, uh, like this is a big evolution of actually the whole market, because actually we see there is a turnover of 50% per year of the patients. It means that. Every year, that even if it looks like there is a, the same amount of patients, half of the patients are different. Are different people, like people get inside the program, they use the medical market, and then they change, and then they go out, and someone else come in, come in. And so we see, yeah, this is the new patient per semester is quite stable. Now it has increased the last year because they have had the one condition that is PTSD. So there is a big amount of people for that that are rolling. But uh, um, yeah, so and the change is also. In, the, in, the, in their profile of the patient. So you see the, the, the average age went from 39 years old in 2009 to 45 in, uh, now in 2017. And we see that from, since 2014, this one looks since the legalization, there is a drop in the prevalence of all the age cohort except for the people in their 60s and 70s that are increasing. So right now the situation is this. We have that all, more than three out of 100 adults in Colorado has, have a prescription like in, in their 60s. Uh, that are in the 60s, they have a prescription for cannabis. And uh, this is like one, more than one out of 100 of the, of the over 70s have one prescription. So, and that's, so that's, an, that's interesting because here there seems to be like a lower prevalence of a prescription and that's probably ideological as well. But for sure it seems that old people are using it more. And this is also because the, the product has changed. So that at the beginning of the market there was only flowers and now there are extracts and and, and drops and you know standardized product and so old people feel like yeah I can use this and they, they also are increasing their prevalence because of that. 
So in terms of conditions, we see that the prev this is, every patient can have a prescription for more than one condition. But we see that more than 90%, both in Colorado and Oregon, uh, have it for chronic pain. So that's the major like, uh, reason for why you get the prescription for cannabis. And then we have spasms and musculosclerosis and then other secondary condition. But looking at the, at the condition that have a low like uh, sort of prevalence, we see that there is a big increase since 2010, 2017 in the prevalence of people that ask for a prescription for cancer and epilepsy or seizure. So this, there seems to be some like uh, practical evidence that there is, a, um, they, they find maybe useful it or they believe it is useful, but it seems it is increasing still. So the conclusion of this first uh, part is that the cannibalization exists and we, we, we say that there is a minimum 5% distortion because 5% of the people that were in the medical market decide to drop and go to the recreational one. But perhaps there are other people that are still using it recreationally that didn't go to the recreational market because they, they just want to pay less money and they might still be there. But what we find is a 5% distortion so far for sure. And we see that medical cannabis demand is changing, so there is higher consumption per capita, older patients, and more severe pathologies. But what we see is that from the studies that there is a, a risk of consumption distortion between the two segments. That means that when you have an only medical legalization, there is an incentive for non-medical users in becoming a patient. And, and therefore, there is a high potential waste of resources in a welfare state context, because we, uh, because I mean, in the European model, we have a subsidized healthcare that is uh, like paying and covering part of the of the cost of the treatment that this doesn't happen in the US in Colorado. So it is complex, it is complicated to integrate cannabis in this case because you cannot separate the market and you cannot verify easily chronic pain that we see is the major like cause. It's, it's harder for physician to really see if you have a pain or you don't. And then, so there is a risk of wasting public funding in this case. And also physician time, if a lot of people go to the physician to get the prescription because they want to get this medical cannabis, that's also a risk for the state. And so the point that we have to understand, I think on, on this is that if you are a heavy non-medical user, you will have a high price sensitivity, which means that you don't want to spend so much for the product. So if the medical cannabis is subsidized and is almost for free or very cheap, a lot of these heavy users will try to get the, the prescription. I mean, this is intuitive. I don't think a lot, maybe some, but it, someone will try to do this. So now looking at how we, we then integrate medical cannabis in European healthcare. Uh, this is like the example we have so far of what we've seen in Europe from this and this Germany that has been trying to uh, kind of uh, satisfy the demand of cannabis. So they also create a reimbursement policy. And, uh, but they, they, they say it's a problem because nobody can get their product. Uh, we see this is in March 2017, well, that's when it started, and we see a 50% increase in the number of patients at, in the first month, and that's a 50% in the other month. Now we have, from, we have 20,000 patients at this moment, so it has more than tripled since uh, the beginning of the program, and is increasing very strongly the number of patients that try to get cannabis now. And what we see, the problem is that we have a demand that is much greater of the supply and that a lot of patients are even not trying to get the prescription because they know that they cannot obtain the product because there is no product. They are only importing from, uh, from abroad now. And the costs are pretty high if you don't have a coverage and it's qu twice as expensive as if you would buy it in the street. Uh, so in, in terms, so we see a limited coverage of the national health system because physicians use it as a last treatment resort. So they, they have to try everything else before to try that. And that's to limit the, the, the adoption of this therapy. But the approval of the insurance company need to be uh, have it before the start of the delivery. So it's very bureaucratic and, and it takes long time for, for a patients actually to be satisfied and to have their product covered. And also, one third of all the demand for reimbursement have been rejected in Germany. And this is increasing like the percentage over time of rejection because the health insurers cannot afford apparently to pay for all of them. So this is all, the, the reason for that uh, kind of problem in the market is based on the distortion that we were talking before of this interrelation between the market and probably policymakers are scared of this, that some people are using it for that. And when you only do a medical regulation, you have that because of the product safety and the product quality of the product, any type of user want to get this product. So, and the, I guess the politician realized this. And in a, in a scenario of full legalization, 
when medical cannabis is cheaper, of the cannabis that you buy in the recreational stores, there will always be a diversion, probably. Like when, and this diversion will be proportional to the price difference. So the more is the difference between recreational and medical, the more recreational user will try to get in the medical market. So the size of the distortion uh, in Colorado is we see is about 5% when they have a 30% tax like price difference between medical and recreational market. But if we look at the average European country that would imagine legalize in 10 years, we see that probably the tax they will impose would be if we like tobacco is like 70%, maybe let's say 50%. But then we have the medical market that is subsidized. So the difference would be much higher that we have in Colorado between medical and recreational uh, prices and cost. So the distortion might be substantial in Europe. So I have this, I developed this theoretical model to try to, to minimize this distortion in, in a way and to make uh, the whole uh, like programs more sustainable. So what, uh, what I'm trying to look at is in the, with this theoretical model is to understand if there is a space for an additional non-profit uh, supplier in the, in the market. In a scenario where we have commercial stores like Colorado that sell it for every adult and we have pharmacies like uh, the, the European way with, through healthcare. So this third uh, supply channel would be attractive to this kind of users, to heavy users and to non-verifiable patients. So patients that have a condition that, you, that a, a doctor can't verify if he has it or not 100% or it's very hard to verify. And now this model, I define the condition under which the distortion will be reduced. So why, why I keep this true model as a base for the legalization? Because the commercial model has some advantage in terms of revenues, in terms of black market minimization because you have a lot of variety in a commercial model so you are able to satisfy all the taste of the consumer and, and because of that you decrease the black market and also there is a good innovation if for instance we innovate in a product that is more environmentally uh, friendly or yeah that has a lower impact but the problem of the commercial model is that there is an interest to promote heavy use because heavy users are the ones that consume most of the product so you, are, you, are, you have an incentive to make them consume more and more for the profits. And also there is a lobbying in the industry that will try to lobby to get the interest of the producer, not of the consumer. In terms of medi the medical model, instead of other advantages, that is that the, the physician are monitoring the, the patients while they use the therapy and also that they support the cost of the cannabis to the patients. But the risk is the waste of funding that we were talking before and also the difficult access for patients that, that have non-verifiable conditions. So a physician can say, I'm not sure you have, you have this, uh, uh, this condition and, or I don't, I'm not sure this condition will really like, uh, be helped by this therapy of cannabis, so I'm not going to pr prescribe it to you. So this is a problem of the medical model in Europe right now. So how the Cannabis Club can help this? So the Cannabis Club is basically a non-profit model where the members kind of produce and distribute their product and is existing in, ve in several countries but Uruguay is the first one that regulated and put a, a serious regulation on this and but regulation but in, in Uruguay is competing with the monopoly like with their uh, state-run monopoly so it's not really the idea that I have in mind but uh, the idea of, the, of this uh, cannabis social club as a fair supply channel is that the price should be like uh, uh, lower compared to recreational stores so you should have a cheaper price in this if you are a member of this uh, uh, cannabis club rather than recreational stores and in this way you would uh, you would try to cap to get the difference between uh, the medical recreational market a bit lower so the distortion will be lower uh, but you don't want that every recreational users will go to the cannabis club so you need to put a sort of entry cost that can be a membership can be an interview with a member something like that and then we have no entry barrier in the recreational stores like in colorado so who would be attracted to the cannabis social club? We see the medical users that cannot obtain a prescription, for instance, they would go there in rather than educational stores where they would pay a 50% tax. Or those that don't want to be registered in a centralized government authority, they might go there. Or those medical users that prefer self-medication because of the experience that might, they might have already with the plant. And uh, in terms of recreational market, the cannabis club would attract all the heavy users that have high price sensitivity, no, pr no privacy concern, and that they have a preference for a non-profit environment. So the optimal supply model to conclude is that we would see that patients with verifiable condition, they should all try to get into the healthcare system. And that's th the way it works for many other therapy uh, in Europe, let's say. But those patients that have not verifiable condition or that uh, you cannot make sure that they, they might have a chance to go also to cannabis social club in a way that they would spend less than in educational stores and that would be like fair i think 
They're creation of heavy users. They could choose between stores and cannabis club, depending on their preference for privacy. And then we have tourists and light users that would go to recreation of stores. So just to be clear, light users are the great majority of the, of the cannabis users in the market. So it's not like recreation of stores would go out of business if they have only light users. But uh, yeah, this is, so this is like the, the, the model that I have. So there are two advantages to conclude. The first is in terms of harm reduction, that is that, uh, and then in, in terms of economic efficiency. So in terms of harm reduction, we see that, that we have a, a reduced relationship between heavy users and profits oriented cannabis industry, but we don't ban the commercial stores. So that's an advantage. Then we have a better monitoring of the consumption of heavy users because we can adopt personal quotas. So in Cannabis Club, normally you say how much you want to consume per month and you can monitor this over time. So if someone wants to increase their quota, there is like a, a red flag, what's going on? Then we have a lar larger uh, fraction of heavy users in the legal sphere because we have this lower price in the cannabis uh, social club that would attract those heavy users inside and that would increase the average product quality and that will make the, uh, the illicit cannabis dealer moving easier to the legal market because from dealer to become cannabis social club uh, owner, it's, it's much easier than to own a shop, let's say, in terms of license. And then we have lower lobbying power because we have a cannabis social club interest. And in terms of economic efficiency, I just look at the second one that is more of interest here, and is that we would have a saving of medical resources like doctor time because of the shift of non-verified patients to a cannabis club, social club. So we would have not these patients uh, like doctor that have 3% of the population coming to their place to try to get a prescription. We would have a much lower, lower like percentage because a lot of them would just go to cannabis club if they, that fits their, their model. And then other advantages. Thank you for the attention.